definitely have a bigger turnout than this. That's okay. They'll join. All right. I mean, unless, uh, I mean, everybody got the link, right? Yeah, I think it's the same link every week. So okay. hopefully everybody's okay. got it. Okay, good. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Plus, it's going to get recorded. So no worries. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Livingston. So my charge today is to talk a bit about congenital lower limb deformities or deficiencies. Like deformity is probably not a very PC term. So yeah, even I guess deficiency isn't. So maybe perhaps it's going to get to differences at some point. But that's sort of, uh, you know, the terminology that's out there. And um, so I divided this talk into two parts. First uh, few slides are on sort of test questions that have come up either in the, you know, in training exam or by the boards and all that. So I think, uh, and rather than me picking on people, which I can, um, maybe best to just have somebody shout out the answer and then the next slide will have the answer. And I know time's limited, but, um, but you know, we'll sort of move along. And then the second part, which is, I guess, two thirds of the talk is a little bit of a cliche is that, you know, I'll show a case or two from my, you know, practice and then um, sort of talk about a lesson learned, you know, if you will. So that's, that's the format. Okay, let's get started. And anybody can interrupt anytime. I'm not good with the hand raise part unless someone wants to moderate that, but just shout out, that's fine. Okay, so, okay, we need a volunteer to read the question. Let's see how that goes. Anybody? Okay, if not, I'll, I'll start. Okay, how about this? Just for time's sake, I'll read the question, but then somebody shout out the answer, okay? So of all the conditions associated with the pathology, and you see an X-ray next, next to the words, you know, um, all are associated with the pathology shown in the figure except. So lateral ray deficiency of the foot, femoral shortening with PFFD, knee cruciate deficiency, congenital vertical talus, and hip dysplasia. Okay, and the answer is, anyone? <clears throat> what's, what's the condition here? Is this tubular hemimelia? Yeah, awesome. And so what do you think the answer is? I think I'm I'm Sarah. I'm one of the two. So I think the answer may be five. Okay, uh, that's one option. Anybody else? I think four. Uh, four. Yeah, yeah. Four. Did somebody? Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's Aaron. Okay, and and honestly, I could be wrong too. It's been a while, but it is four. <clears throat> so yeah. So you can have hip dysplasia because you know fibular hemimelia is like a lateral deficiency that goes, starts all the way up the pelvis and then comes down to the toes. And we'll show a couple of cases and pictures of that. And somehow, you know, I think fibular hemimilia is one of the congenital lower extremity sort of uh, differences that comes up quite often in, in test taking. <clears throat> okay, speaking of which, the condition shown in figure is associated with all the following except so again, these are two different years, two different questions, but somewhat related. Okay, what's the answer? Absent lateral raise, ACL deficiency, quadriceps hypertonia, ball and socket ankle, ankle and coxa vera. You can shout out, it's okay. I, I won't even know the name, so it's okay. Is it quadriceps hypertonia? Awesome, awesome, yes, that's it. Okay, beautiful, yeah. So we'll, and one more. So this is again, a related question. So which of these is associated with fibular hemimelia? And so what, what do you think this is? We'll just sort of go through all five pictures and then we'll answer the question. What's this? I know, limited x-rays, limited time. What is the upper left one? You guys can see my arrow? Yeah, mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be a congenital problem, by the way. It's a pediatric orthopedic problem, right? You see the growth plate here compared to here, a little bit of obese kid, adolescent, outgoing on the left. Skivvy. Yes, awesome, good. 
Okay, what do you think the bottom left is? What kind of Boeing is this? Interior lateral Boeing of the trapezius. Yeah, and what's that associated with, typically? Um, Neurofibromas, NF. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, and what's the middle one here? What kind of Boeing is that? The apex is, I know it's kind of, one of them is sort of an oblique. I'm sorry? Posteromedial. Yeah, postromedial, exactly. And that can be associated with what sort of the long term issue with those? Like mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Okay, and what's the one? Uh, okay, what's this one? Sorry, what was the answer to that? What's it associated with? Uh, leg length discrepancy. This, this limb is typically shorter. The angulation, you know, evolves and improves over time, maybe not fully. But um, the long term issue is my leg length discrepancy, typically less than five centimeters at maturity. All right, what's this? Bond factor ankle. Yep, awesome. And this? Is that a knee dis congenital knee dislocation? Uh, it could be associated with that, but just look at the lower segment, which bone is, you know. So is, is that like a tibial hemimalia? Awesome, exactly. That's tibial hemimalia. Okay, so what's the answer to the question? Which of these is associated with fibular hemimalia? Ball and socket ankle. Awesome, good. Am I not advancing now? Okay, good. Yeah, so that, that was that. Okay, so just to recap then, you know, and, and again, even congenitally short femur and fibular hemimalia, this is a continuum. Just because a patient has one, there's actually a good chance that they may have a component of the other one. So in general, these patients will have, um, you know, may have a short femur. And this slide doesn't talk about everything. Like it doesn't talk about the hip dysplasia, doesn't talk about the femoral retroversion that a lot of these patients will have um, around the knee. You can have a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle. Uh, the patella can be subluxed laterally, ACL, PCL deficiency, um, obviously genu valgum. Uh, you know, the flattened tibial eminence is just a surrogate for the ACL deficiency. You can have a short tibia and, you know, short fibula, ankle valgus, ball and socket ankle, you know, tarsal coalitions and uh, missing lateral rays. So again, if you see any one of these, look for everything else, right? And this comes up clinically too, which we'll get into. Okay, 12 month old uh, congenital fibular hemimilia with a normal limb, radiographs of the lower extremity shows a two centimeter LLD. All of the shortening is in the right tibia, assuming that no treatment is rendered prior to skeletal maturity. The LLD will most likely what, remain two centimeters at mature? Oh, oh God, it's my fingers. Okay, but, okay, so the answer is increase slowly with the right lower extremity remaining in proportion to the left lower extremity. And I think that, that's another important concept that, you know, because this comes up pretty frequently when you're talking to parents um, of a young child who has congenital shortening, like what's it gonna be at maturity? And a short answer is that the percentage shortening is gonna stay the same, but obviously the amount of shortening will increase over time. And, you know, Shapiro sort of did a nice job with this and sort of he looked at, uh, you know, different sort of evolution of LLD over time in a growing child. And so this is the most common and classic with a congenital shortening, meaning that the slope of, so here you see age in years and discrepancy in centimeters, I guess. And so as the kid grows, obviously the amount in centimeters will increase, but the slope is pretty, sta uh, pretty stable, right? So that means if let's say the right short leg is growing at 80% of the left, normal side, that percentage growth inhibition will stay the same, right? But so, so uh, another way to look at it is if the kid's right foot, which is short, I mean, the leg is short, 
is at the level of the mid tibia of the other side, that relationship is actually going to be about the same, right, at maturity. And, you know, Paley and others have sort of come up with this multiplier method, which, you know, is, is another tool. Uh, and some people have questioned the validity of this for accuracy, especially in adolescence. Okay. I just have a whole, yeah. I had a question. So I saw that there's a couple different um, methods for measuring leg length discrepancy, like using the multiplier, or there's like graphs. Are there one, is there one that people use at UCSF or one that's more generally accepted or is it really a physician preference what they use? Well, it's, that's a great question. Um, so honest answer is if you look at how all these you know, methods have been derived, they've been derived from one or two databases, at least in North America that were you know, from the sixties. And those were based on, I mean, the, the classic paper is the Green Anderson paper from Boston Children's. Um, and that was based off, you know, kids, white, uh, and I mean, talk about diversity here, right? So uh, that was based uh, on Caucasian kids who had polio. And they sort of, you know, they, they had 50 kids, actually, I think 100 kids, 50 boys, 50 girls, and they followed them over time. So the multiplier, the Mosley, uh, not the Menelos, which is, you know, which is Australian. Um, so they've been derived from data sets from way back and people can question the methodology. Some have even done sort of anthropologic sort of things. Uh, what sort of uh, the multiplier method um, claim to fame was that no matter which data set you see, whatever in the world, the multiplier is going to you know, stays constant, you know, in terms of, you know, a one-year-old will have a discrepancy that's, if it's congenital, that's going to be uh, three times more at maturity. So the short, long answer to your question is that, yes, it's variable, but it shouldn't be really a physician preference. It's really, you know, looking at the science. And nowadays, even someone as clunky as me has on my phone you know, a, a little software where I can just put in the numbers and I can get, get an answer. But ultimately, you got to piece this with, you know, growth remaining. And just like a word on that, that's where the controversy is. Because ultimately, what you want to do is figure out, you know, discrepancy at maturity and do things. If let's say you're doing an epiphysiodesis, that what's the right age? And for that, in the last two years, a lot of data suggests that, interestingly, the Menelaus method, which is a relatively straightforward one, is which is an arithmetic method that you know distal femur grows nine millimeters a year, you know proximal tibia grows six millimeters a year. Boys stop growing at age sixteen. Girls stop growing at age fourteen. Is actually as accurate, if not more, than all the fancy ones. The only caveat is that instead of using chronologic age, if you use skeletal age, the accuracy improves. So that, that's sort of the take home, right? You could, you know, in a clinic setting, you could, yes, you can use all these softwares and formulae, but end of the day, especially in the adolescent sort of age group, you know, you can use Menelaus with a skeletal age, okay? Thanks. Okay, um, so 13 year old boy shortening of the right leg. Um, so what's the diagnosis? This is the same picture as the last one. What's the diagnosis guys, gals? Tibial hemimalia. Yeah, awesome, yeah. And again, the differential, look at the foot or the leg, you know, sometimes for the untrained eye, they will think of this as a club foot, right? So, you know, you gotta sort of look at these kids. So which of the following findings is most predictive of a good outcome with SIME amputation? And for anyone who doesn't know, SIME amputation is an ankle disarticulation. So what's the most predictive factor that this kid's gonna have a good outcome if you, you know, disarticulate at the ankle? Go ahead, anyone? Quad strength. I'm sorry? Yes, quad strength, perfect, exactly. So, yeah, and you know, let me just see how our time is. Okay. And by the way, Kristen, you can remind me if I go over and I'll stop. Okay. Will do. 
Okay, good. So, you know, this is kind of the classic Jones uh, classification, which we won't get into. But the bottom line is, like was mentioned, um, that you got to look at quadriceps function when you're dealing with uh, tibial hemimalia. Okay, um, right. So that this slide kind of says the same thing. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about cases that you know I've sort of seen. So this was back in 2001 um, in my Jersey days. Um, a kid, uh, probably a six-month-old, antromedial Boeing, three rays, obviously fibular hemimilia, correct? But look at the history. So she had social issues. I still remember this mom. Um, you know, and, and again, you know, when we talk about DEI and you know what to do, I, I think cases like this don't have a straight answer, at least in my mind, but at least it's an issue to ponder, right? So she is somewhat underprivileged, single mom, speaks little English, has six kids, limited resources. And that's her baby's x-ray, you know, fibular hemimilia, not a big, big leg length dif difference. And, I, and that time I was probably what, four or five years into practice. I was really into, you know, doing fancy operations, lengthenings, and I thought I could do this. But then, you know, I look at the family, I look at the mom, I look at the resources that she can actually afford come for weekly physical therapy. And deep down, I just couldn't talk myself into doing a lengthening, right? So then we sort of had a heart to heart and long story short, we ended up with a sign amputation. Um, and I really didn't know how this kid's gonna do. And so I kid you not, I followed her for like 15 years and she did awesome. She did, this is her six years later, just because by the way, you do a sign doesn't mean that the valgus of the knee is gonna suddenly disappear. That doesn't happen. So, you know, if you see the hypoplastic lateral condyle, she must have gone into valgus. I did a couple of guided growths, took the plate on and off. This is her six years later, you know, a lot of same day procedures, not a lot, maybe four. Um, but that's it, no lengthening, no major physical therapy, did the amputation around age one to sort of, um, you know, coordinate it with what motor milestones are when a kid starts walking. And here she is when she graduated high school, she played basketball, she, you know, ran a bit and was very thankful. So I, I feel like the lesson here is you gotta match the patient family expectations with resource availability. And people could argue like, you know, why deny this family a lengthening? But I think that's still an unanswered question. You know, a bad, a, length, a lengthening gone bad with poor function and a scarred childhood, I would say is so much worse than a happy child who's sort of normalized in society, you know, with a, with a good amputation. So, okay. Uh, Eight-year-old boy from, uh, I think from, uh, from Egypt, uh, migrated to US about a year ago, doesn't speak English, speak much English, they're just getting settled here. And again, I show these cases partly for orthopedics, but partly for real life decision-making, right? And so now he's older, unlike the last kid who, you know, as an infant, it's so much easier to adjust to an amputation. Um, there for social cultural reasons, you know, family didn't want an amputation. Plus, unlike the last kid, this kid's got a very functional foot. So what do you do with this kid? You know, he's got this bulky prosthesis that he doesn't want to use. It's called a prosthosis. Um, exam, I won't get into, but a huge leg length difference, not a great knee motion, but a very functional foot. Um, this, is, uh, this is how he walks three different ways. I hope this plays, oh yeah. So see, he can walk like this, he can walk like that, he can hop like that, and he can do that. And it's up to you to figure out, hey, which of these is sustainable, if any? And is that gonna sort of be how he moves as he gets older? So, you know, um, th these are what his x-rays look like, very deficient, deformed, you know, femur, knee, stenogram you know, 3D CT, 
And you know, you can talk about different classifications. This is one of the ones that people talk about because it helps us, you know, figure out in terms of decision making, et cetera. Um, but the point here is you got to understand the deformity, right? And understand, obviously, more importantly, the social situation and the child and the family that is with that extra. So don't make, you know, sudden decisions just based on you know, what ortho bullets, I'm sorry, I don't want to name any, name, but what any sort of textbook uh, talks about without looking at the, the big picture. So I think this could sort of, I wasn't sure how this is going to go, but all I wanted to do initially was without committing the family to any one option like ablation, rotation, plasty, you know, amputation, I said, no matter what, he'll need a good hip. So we did a super hip, which again is a long story. I think some people know about this. You try to reconstruct the hip anatomy as best as you can. Um, and then, you know, so you go from there. But uh, it's, it's a combination of a lot of soft tissue releases and, you know, you normalize the proximal femoral anatomy. So these are, you know, a few slides from Bailey's uh, technique. Um, but it, it is it is a good operation, but it, it is a little bit technically challenging. So what did we end up with? You know, he he also has a pseudoarthrosis of his proximal femur, but it's a it's a stable pseudoarthrosis, and I think with time it'll ossify. And actually, this is and you can see his patella is dislocated. So, you know, the family did not want any kind of ablative procedures, and this really didn't improve his prosthetic wear, but it started normalizing his anatomy while the family's adjusting to their new sort of social cultural environment. I actually got an email last year uh, from another institution in the Northeast that, that uh, they told me that they finally consented to a knee arthrodesis and a foot ablation. Um, and that the kid's really doing well now with the prosthesis. So it takes time. So these are some of the options. And again, some of this is a little complicated, but just, just to sort of put it out there that there's no one cookbook approach. You got to match your expertise, your clinical experience, family's expectations and resources, and you know what's functionally the right thing for the child. Um, this is another patient. This one I saw here in the clinic uh, when, the, when the patient was a 17 year old. And so he had had a sign amputation as an infant, but then he was in denial. The family didn't want to do anything. And so this is, it's interesting to see how, you know, as a seven year old, you're like, this thing's going to just break. But what it is, is an unossified cartilage, which eventually ossifies. So this one, we just did this sort of super hip procedure and, you know, a plug for our 3D printing abilities at UCSF, you know, this was very helpful. And so, you know, you just sort of normalize the anatomy with a super hip. And I, 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 I see him, you know, I've seen him probably three times and he's what, almost a year out and he's very happy now. I mean, at least he, he can wear his prosthesis. He actually was a dancer with his, in his prosthesis and he can, he can do that. Um, this is another kid I saw very recently. Another child from, uh, you know, with a congenitally short femur who's had a rotation plasty, you know, and a rotation plasty is something that, you know, so you basically try to do 180 degree rotation of the limb and your ankle becomes your new knee so that when the kid is plantar flexing, they're actually sort of doing a pseudo knee extension, if you will. And if they're dorsiflexing, they're doing a pseudo knee flexion. So somebody had attempted twice to do that with a knee fusion and the sort of, despite the appearance, the sort of um, people who do it, the issue is that it's better for, you know, energy con conservation because technically, you know, a kid with a, a rotation plasty behaves like a below knee amputee rather than an above knee amputee or a knee dysartic. But, you know, Talk about frustration. This family was so frustrated because despite two attempts, 
the heel was still not in the right place. And um, again, this is how the kid walks or moves around, either this or that. It's a little different than the other one, but you know, not much. So again, same story, what do we do here? In this one, I thought the family was adjusted enough, the dad was you know, committed, so we convinced them to try something else. So this was his bulky prosthesis. You, know, you can see, despite this being touted as you know, he would be a baloney amputee uh, prosthetic wearer, you know, he's got a very bulky prosthesis that goes above his pelvis, right? And he hardly uses it because his heel is not sort of you know, front and back. It's sort of every time he tries to dorsiflex or plantar flex, the leg goes sideways. So not good. So here again, you know, we did a 3D model because I didn't know where his neurovascular bundle is and this and that. And also he's still growing and his uh, sort of pseudo knee is too high for when he'll be done growing. So what we did here is we planned to gradually derotate him. And as we're doing that, we would lengthen him, you know, two to three centimeters. Um, so that's kind of what we did gradually. And um, I just saw him, he's only a month from his fixator removal. He's from um, a little far away. So he's getting actually people who are at the, at the, at the shrine in Sacramento probably will see him. Um, and from what I hear, he's doing much better. So now his heel is in the right place. His, you know, his pseudo knee on the right, which is his ankle is longer, which is great because when he's done growing, it'll be at a better position and uh, family's happy. You can already see we've downsized his prosthesis from above the pelvis to below. So more to come. So I think lesson is decision is more important than the incision, right? What we talked about. Okay, congenitally short femur, nine year old. These are some older patients. And here the point is, you know, remember how we talked about all these different things, including hip dysplasia, ACL, PCL deficiency. So the thing is, if you do not, let's say you don't address the hip dysplasia and you lengthen that femur, as you lengthen the femur, that hip's gonna, you know, perhaps come out of the socket, right? Because it's already deficient. And unlike other sort of causes for limb shortening, in a congenital, congenitals are the hardest to lengthen because the body is not prepared for a longer length. Like what was dialed in for soft tissues is the shorter length compared to somebody who's got, let's say a post-traumatic limb shortening. There the body is programmed for being longer. So the soft tissues, the bone, everything can be more accommodative, um, not in congenitals. So here as a first stage, uh, we sort of, you know, um, did a pelvic osteotomy to protect his hip and his leg length difference was too much. So after talking to family, we also did a little bit of contralateral, well, we did a contralateral epiphysiodesis, which will help, but will not fully, um, you know, address his LLD. So then as a second stage, uh, we did uh, a lengthening, but again, that's another option. Instead of doing a ACL reconstruction, which I'll show you some pictures of, here we put hinges across the knee to protect the knee while you know the kid was getting the lengthening. And so with these hinges, you know, you kind of lock them and it protects the knee uh, against subluxing. So I won't get into the details here. Okay, so the, the lesson is you gotta, before lengthening, assess and address any joint issues, joint deficiencies, because ultimately what you're after is good function. You can always lengthen more, but if you got lousy joints, you know, cartilage doesn't take a joke too easy, right? So once, once the bone, once the joint gets messed up, you know, that's it. Okay, so another patient, we did a lengthening for a congenital shortening, these kids can often, if you did it with a fixator, which we do less and less of now, um, you know, they have almost a 30% chance of refracture of the lengthening regenerate. And, and that's a pain, right? You've spent all these months lengthening, the kid's gone through therapy, 
it comes off a fixator and the bone breaks. It's just, it's so disheartening still. Um, so anyway, most people talk about, and that's what at least I do. If I, I do a lengthening with a fixator, especially in the femur or congenitals, I'll do a prophylactic little elastic nail of some sort just to protect the regenerate and also allow the knee to move quicker. So lesson is protect the lengthened bone. But you know, what happened here? Despite that, despite the nail, he fell down some stairs and bent the nail. So, you know, and that's a picture of another patient, but the error here is, and I don't know if that was the error here in this patient, but at least in this other patient, this pin is too eccentric, right? And the anterior surface of the femur is sort of the tension side, right? The femur is bored a little bit. So that's a stress riser. So even when you're putting x fix pins for anything, right? Try not to be eccentric. Try to be sort of in the center. And so certainly err on the side to avoid the tension side of the bone because these things can happen. So, you know, learn from every complication. And, you know, our first instance is like, well, it was probably the patient, he fell down some stairs but always go back and see what you could have done differently, right? Uh, okay, so, and then don't give up. You know, so this kid, we ended up revising the fixation, put a plate, kept going on. And here he is at skeletal maturity. He's got great knee function. He's got, you know, pretty close to equal leg lengths and family's happy. So, you know, especially in the lengthening world and Dr. Livingston knows it, uh, you know, it's a bumpy road, but don't give up when down. I mean, that, that's really a life lesson, but I think we talk about perseverance all the time, but I, I think it, it definitely holds true in the lengthening world. Okay, a more recent case, you know, I did here. Um, so same thing, you know, this kid didn't have a congenitally short femur, a little hypoplastic fibula, a little ball and socket, not a ball and socket ankle, but uh, a fibula that's not distal enough. Um, his uh, hip is fine. So first thing we do is, and he was ACL deficient with a positive Lachman and a pivot. So first thing is prepare, right? Prepare the family, prepare the joints, prepare the leg, improve the limb alignment. So Dr. Pandya and I did the surgery together. He did the ACL, extra physial, and I did the guided growth at the knee and the ankle to get him out of, you know, genu valgum and hindfoot valgus. So then he's ready. And then, you know, you can now, at least in this patient, do it more user-friendly way with a magnetic uh, intermedullary lengthening, you know. But this, this lengthening nail obviously is much different than your standard trauma nail. It's a solid nail uh, and it has its own issues, but uh, certainly a huge step in the right direction when you talk about femoral lengthening, when you don't need much deformity correction, definitely. And, and I was not like, I, I was a skeptic the first couple of years, but you know, then we started doing them and oh my God, it is such a difference for the most part. Things can still go bad, really bad, but uh, you know, overall a better experience for the patient and family too. So, you know, this is sort of his early follow-up after a five, five and a half centimeter lengthening and he did, he did really well, he maintained his knee motion. So again, study principles, just because you got a new device doesn't mean you forget the biology of limb lengthening, the distraction, osteogenesis, need for physical therapy, et cetera. How are we doing on time? Okay, we got time, right? Kristen, how much time do I have, 10 minutes? Um, yeah, I mean, if we want to give everybody maybe a, a yes. couple okay. minute break in between, just we'll okay. wrap All up right. just okay. before 930. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, so then let me just quickly run through some more. So two-year-old, you know, congenitally short femur. Um, here again, we did this sort of super hip. And this this is actually a patient that didn't do so well, right? My, my pelvic osteotomy was not a great one. It, I think something must have cracked. And this is sort of where, you know, what is it called? Cognitive dissonance. Like I, I tried to convince myself that this is gonna be okay. That is her, so this was my attempt at a preparatory surgery. I think I did pretty well to reconstruct the proximal femur, but I did probably get a C or a B minus 
for her pelvic osteotomy. I don't have great coverage, but I talked myself into it with an arthrogram to say, well, but yeah, she's got good coverage. Look at the arthrogram, right? But that's cartilage, that's soft. That's not bone. And what I did is I, I lengthened her, but I protected her hip by extending up into the pelvis and thinking like, that's gonna be fine. But no, as she's lengthening, despite the pins in the pelvis, you know, she starts subluxing. So of course I was like, okay, that's enough. So I, I take the fixator off. Uh, well, I stop lengthening. I take the fixator off. I put a prophylactic nail, but then thinking with therapy, she's gonna get better, but she didn't. Um, then I go back and I kind of have to undo or overdo. Well, I sort of did an opening wedge varus osteotomy of the femur to keep the hip in. And I think I may have also done another pelvic osteotomy. But the, the point here is your first chance is your best chance, you know? And so, yes, I gave her some length, but I messed up her hip joint. So you got to like think about that. Um, and I think this is sort of the last couple of slides. So this is her. Not only did I mess up her hip joint, look at that hip joint and arthrogram, you know, a couple of years later, a year later probably. And then, you know, her knees also stiff. And when you see a patient like this, you're like, oh my God, I missed the boat. So she ended up with a quadriceps plasty. I think the last I heard she's doing okay, but you know, she's still not perfect. So, you know, therapy is important. And the point is don't sacrifice function for length. So really that's, uh, that's a summary. And uh, yeah, I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Actually, we're doing good for time. Okay, questions, anybody? Uh, Dr. Sabra, uh, thank you. That was a great, that was very educational. Um, I think in the past you told, you've taught me and uh, a little bit about differences when deciding between uh, um, Taylor spatial frames and uh, precise nailing regarding soft tissue uh, management uh, and, you know, your experience with the pros and cons of either. Would you mind, um, I guess, repeating yeah. that and sharing that for the group? I think that's helpful. Yeah, sure. Definitely. So, okay, let's just talk about the femur because I think the femur is one where, you know, the soft tissues are even more important. And I guess the, the one sort of uh, big sort of inhibitor or obstacle to lengthening, be it internal or external, is the fascia lata. Because you know what the fascia lata does is, as we all know, you know, it attaches distally to the Gurdy's tubercle. And as you lengthen the femur, the fascia lata gets tight. And what happens, especially think about it, you got, let's say somebody with ACL deficiency, whose knee is already unstable, you lengthen the femur, the fascia lata gets tight. Not only do they get a flexion contracture of the knee, they also get this sort of anterolateral instability of the tibia on the femur, right? Because it attaches to the Gurdy's tubercle. As things contract, it's not a simple, you know, knee flexion contracture. So the point uh, that Gopal's, uh, you know, helping me make is that doesn't matter, even if you're doing it with a nail, you still have to do a prophylactic fascia lateral release in order to sort of circumvent that. Yeah, granted your sort of transfixation of the soft tissues isn't gonna be that bad when you're doing an intramedullary lengthening, but some of those things, um, you know, matter. You know, and one other sort of downside with a nail compared to an X-fix, you saw a case or two it wasn't that hard to extend the fixator from the femur to the knee or to the tibia distally or the pelvis proximally. That option is not there with an intramedullary nail. And you know, when you talk to people and go to meetings, people haven't quite publicized this yet, but if you talk to some of their physical therapists, they'll tell you they're actually seeing more hip and knee instabilities with intramedullary lengthenings than they did with the X-fixes. Part of the reason is you can only control so much with bracing and positioning. So it's like that classic thing, you know, you sort of jump on a new technique, it'll come with better outcomes for the old problems, but it'll create new problems that weren't there before. And I think, so, so again, that's again, one of these life lessons for orthopedics and clinicians, right? You, you sort of, you know, jump on a new technique, but just do it, you know, 
with sort of open eyes and ears.